similar to glass uh, physics, of course. So uh, I give you a couple of general reference. This is, of course, far from being exhaustive. Uh, there is a small uh, paper in, uh, in uh, an encyclopedia that uh, Springer uh, uh, wrote. There is a nice review that was uh, written in collaboration with uh, Elisabeth Agoritsas and, and Vivien uh, Lecomte. And uh, uh, there is a whole volume of the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences where there are several review articles, one by Ezekiel and the rest of the Bariloche gang in, in, in particular. But there are also experimental reviews on magnetic system, ferroelectric systems, and so on and so forth. Uh, the cover of the, of the thing is a domain wall uh, in a ferroelectric system that comes from the group of Patricia Parouche in uh, University of Geneva. Okay. So at t equals zero, namely if we don't put any temperature, I would say many things are well understood. It doesn't mean that everything is understood, but many things are well understood. And in particular, it's well known that the wall, because of the presence of disorder, will be rough. And you can measure the relative displacement correlation function. It grows as a Paolo with an exponent which in 1D is known exactly and in a higher dimension can be computed in particular by functional renormalization technique as uh, uh, for example Pierre and Kai are, are, are have done extensively. Uh, in 1D this is related to KPZ equation and essentially this exponent is known exactly and it's two-thirds. So the if you go out of equilibrium, so if you try to pull on the domain wall with uh, exerting a force on the problem, then this is the well-known depinning phenomenon where the velocity is zero up to a critical force and then bingo, it starts to, it starts to move. And of course, there are uh, some analogy with a critical phenomenon. We, we can come back to that a little bit later in the sense that the velocity will, uh, is expected to be a power law of the distance to the threshold with a certain exponent beta. And there is a correlation length, for example, in the velocity-velocity correlation uh, 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 along the wall, which is diverging at the transition here, of course, coming from above, uh, as a power law of the distance to the transition with an exponent nu, uh, which again, one can compute. Okay, so these things are, are well known. And of course, there is a strong challenge, which is to understand how the temperature, because most experiments are done at finite temperature, let's say all experiments are done at finite temperature. There is a way to cheat. No, no, but there are some nice elastic system like contact line of uh, liquid on a substrate for which one can consider the temperature is effectively zero. But I would say uh, many uh, experiments one needs to take into account the, the temperature and there are many consequences. So many of them, I won't have time to discuss them, but uh, since many of the people who worked on this are there, you can ask them directly. So for a single line, for example, the temperature controls uh, the, the prefactor in a non-trivial way. Uh, so there's not just the exponent in the roughness function, but there are some prefactors. And Elisabeth and uh, Vivien worked a lot on that. Uh, for periodic system, there are new length scales that appear. Uh, we worked on this together with Laura Foini. And of course, the most important consequence is on the dynamics, because uh, there are two, uh, two aspects. First, because you have finite temperature, now you can pass barrier, not because you pull on the system, but because thermal activation allows you to pass over the barrier. So first, the depinning transition will be rounded. Just like if you put a finite magnetic field on an easing model, the magnetization is always finite. So there is a rounding of the thermal depinning. So there, are, there is a way to study this thing. And in particular, the velocity exactly at the critical force is a power law of the temperature with an exponent which, to the best of my knowledge, for the moment, nobody knows how to compute. It can be measured by a numerical simulation. It can even be measured in experiments. But on a more analytic level, we have no clue on what is controlling this exponent. At least I have no clue. Okay. Uh, more importantly, I will focus on, on uh, 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 the, the what is called the creep. And again, because creep can mean different things for different people, just tell me, let me tell you what I call creep. So if I pull on the domain wall with a force and I measure the velocity, then of course now if I am at finite temperature, the velocity is non-zero every, uh, every force. So I assume an overdamped dynamics. I will ignore inertia. So I assume that the friction is dominating everything. And you might want to know what is the response of the problem if you are pulling on the system with an extremely small force. So for most systems, we always 
think linear response, so we think that the velocity will be proportional to the force. Of course, here it would be uh, too boring if it was true. And um, the response is much richer than just velocity proportional to the force. And this is a problem that was first studied very phenomenologically by a scaling hypothesis, which was uh, worked out by Lev Yoffe, Valérie Vinocure, and practically simultaneously by Thomas Natherman. And uh, we did, together with uh, Pascal Chauve and Pierre Le Doussal, a more formal analysis of this problem by using functional renormalization group. Uh, and I'm going to discuss some of the consequences that one can extract out of the FRG analysis. Okay, so the first uh, consequence or the first physics that happens in this uh, uh, problem, so I have a domain wall which is subjected to disorder and I pull on it with an extremely small force. And the first thing that happens is how will the domain wall move? And the domain wall can only move by thermal activation because of course the force is too small to have it pass the barrier by really the force. So the way it will move is by trying Arrhenius activation over the barrier. And what you can pull out both from the scaling analysis and the FRG is that there will be an optimal nucleus which is inversely proportional to a power of the force and which is related to the roughness exponent at equilibrium that we uh, uh, discussed before, so <coughs> in the static. And this uh, optimal nucleus tells that the system tries many thermal activation here and then there is one or a, se a sequence that succeeds and then the system moves uh, with this uh, event. So just the scaling analysis would have said, oh well, then we repeat the process and we repeat the process and this is how the line is moving forward. And of course, because this takes a lot of time, if you need to move a, a, uh, a, a typical size like this, you, you, you have to overcome a barrier which is a power law of the size of the, of the nucleus, which means you can expect a time to move which will be exponential of minus a power law of the force. Okay, so a highly nonlinear response. But what one found uh, uh, doing the FRG is that after this event takes place, this has pushed the thing over the edge. So it's the, it has started the process, but then there is an avalanche that is triggered by, uh, by this, uh, the fact that the line has moved forward a little bit. And this is much more like a deepening event. So this is like you pulled with a force which is larger than the critical force, and then the, th the, 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 the system moves relatively rapidly. <laughs> so actually, we find that there are two length scales in this problem. Uh, this thermal nucleus, which is sometimes called also elopt, so the notation will change later in the talk, so RT or elopt, and then another length scale, much larger, which is an avalanche length scale, which would not have existed without the nucleus, without the thermal nucleus, but which is much larger and which describe a fast process uh, coming from uh, the reorganization of the line. Of course, the velocity is controlled entirely by the first or mostly by the first, but if you look at the aspect of the line, you have to worry about uh, the second one. So just to show you that this is not just a view of the theorist, and I uh, represented uh, what I would call canonical experiments, those from the last century, uh, but there are much more modern experiments uh, which uh, fully uh, go in the same, uh, in the same uh, direction. So here is the prediction for the velocity. It's exponential of minus one over the force to a certain exponent, and this exponent is related to dimension of space and equilibrium exponent uh, a roughness exponent. So we know, for example, for a 1D domain wall, D is equal to 1, zeta is equal to 2 thirds. So if you replace, you will find that mu is equal to 1 quarter, so there is no freedom here. And here are experiments that were done in the group of uh, Orsay on magnetic films. So you see here a domain wall uh, at two different positions. I have a movie, but I don't have the time to show it to you. I can show it later if you're interested. Here is a measure of the log of the velocity plotted as one over the field, which is the force here, to the power one quarter. And you see that it, it, does, it gives you a very nice straight line here, uh, which is the confirmation of this law. And I point your attention on the vertical scale. It goes essentially from zero to minus 25 in a uh, Neperian log, which is essentially 10 orders of magnitude on the velocity. So this is a, a serious test of, the, of, the, of this stretch exponential. 
similar results have been observed in ferroelectric, so for ferroelectric domain wall in the group of uh, Patricia Parouche and uh, Jean-Marc Crispin. Uh, here is again the velocity as a function of the field, so here the exponent has not been put, which is why the curves are, are bended, but the, the, the straight lines are the theory and the, and the points are, are the data. So the uh, predictions on the average velocity are very well uh, verified uh, in experiments. Now, uh, you would like to know more, and you would like in particular to study this length scale that I was, that I was discussing. And of course, then it's a little bit difficult to go beyond an FRG analysis, which is done in four minus epsilon dimension, so not particularly adapted to study d equal one, for example, to start with. And you would like to turn to numerics, but this is very difficult. Uh, if you try to do molecular dynamics, we tried that a couple of years ago with uh, Alejandro Colton and Alberto Rosso. Of course, the exponentially long time kill you. If you want to go in the creep regime, it, it's very, very tough. And so to, uh, to circumvent this problem, a couple of years ago, uh, there was an exact enumeration algorithm that was uh, uh, used or invented, uh, you would say. So the idea of this uh, exact enumeration algorithm is uh, to forget the time, but just to determine what are the configurations. So you start from a configuration, and then you essentially enumerate all the possible paths, compute the barriers, and check uh, how you can go from this configuration to this configuration. So this uh, worked very well, and it allowed to show something which was a little bit annoying for those who like to view uh, deepening as a critical phenomenon, which is that actually on one side of the transition you had indeed a divergent length scale, but on the other side of the transition there was one length scale which was going actually to zero or to a microscopic cutoff uh, when you approach the transition from the other side. So for the static or the, the quasi-static of the line, there was not a symmetric divergent length scale on both sides of the transition. But this algorithm is also suffering from difficulties because it's working super efficiently around the deepening. But if you go deep into the low uh, force uh, region, uh, you have many, many configurations to enumerate. The size of the nucleus that move is getting bigger and bigger, and the problem grows exponentially again, so you're dead. So uh, more recently, uh, together with Ezekiel, Laura Foini, Alejandro Colton, and Alberto Rosso, there was a sort of uh, upgrade or, or variant on this algorithm. And since Ezekiel is here, all difficult questions on the algorithm should be directed to him, uh, of course, <laughs> uh, which instead of enumerating all the move as the exact algorithm does, was only sort of focusing on compact moves. So the idea is that we want to reproduce this idea of thermal nucleus. So we, we are not trying to enumerate all the configurations, but one can consider the starting configuration and then find a new configuration uh, which corresponds to a compact uh, displacement. Again, this is an algorithm that quotes ignores the time, so uh, we can uh, essentially uh, avoid the exponentially uh, small time. Just to show that it works, uh, these are comparisons for the structure factor uh, and uh, uh, the, the events, the, so the avalanche that I'm going to discuss a little bit later in more details, between the exact algorithm and the so-called approximate algorithm. I think it's not, uh, it's not a good name, but uh, the more modern algorithm, let's call it that way, and you see that the agreement between the two methods, when they can be compared, is really excellent, which gives confidence that one can do, uh, can use the new algorithms uh, reliably. The advantage is it allows to go to forces which were about 100 times smaller than the, the forces that could be reached with the, uh, with the uh, previous algorithm. So let me give you a, a flash of the results. So the average velocity, we can confirm the exponential law, uh, really uh, precisely. Uh, we can confirm the new length scales that uh, were predicted from the FRG. And of course, as usual, when you get a new tool, you get new results. And among the new results, we, will, we were able to obtain the distribution of avalanches, and we were able to show something funny, uh, which I will discuss uh, a little bit later, which is the correlation of this uh, avalanche event. So for the length scale, just as a recap, uh, this is the, uh, let's say, uh, a snapshot of the line uh, as a function of the distance 
at which you, you look along the, the direction of the line. So this would be the roughness ex exponent that you would measure if you were doing measurement at the distance r. Uh, you, take you move with the referential of the line. This is the force that has been exerted. So the velocity here goes to zero if it was a depending uh, phenomenon with a power law. Uh, for the creep, uh, we have that the velocity is uh, the log of v is a power law of the force with the exponent which I showed you previously, with the equilibrium roughness, which is the important point. And if you look at the line, the line look equilibrated at short distance, which is well compatible with the idea that it tries a lot of thermal moves at short distance. And it looked like a deep in line with a different exponent, which is the deepening exponent. If you look at large distance, which certainly confirms that larger distance are controlled by this deepening avalanche, I would say. Okay, uh, now uh, can we say a little bit more on avalanches? So let me show you uh, a, a movie, uh, if I can uh, click. Uh, yeah, I should be able to click. Uh, maybe I will move a little bit uh, further. So this is just to show, and I'll come back to this, the difference of the avalanche that you would get at t equals zero close to the deepening and the avalanche that you would get close to the creep. So this is directly extracted from the, from the, 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 the numerical simulation. So let me just show you a, a, a short part of the movie. Uh, here is the line. The events which are colored here are of course the way the line is moving forward. And you get a, a little cartoon on the right of the, the transverse size and of course the time uh, is, is flowing here. So you see where the events are uh, occurring. And when you look at this, you immediately see that there is a very strong spatial correlations uh, between the various events that are uh, occurring uh, in the creep regime. Okay, so let's try to compare. Uh, here is the deepening avalanches, so standard, I would say, uh, uh, methods at t equals zero. You see that in that case, the avalanches arrive, so same color means essentially same time, the avalanches arrive in a completely random and uncorrelated way. So essentially an event arrives here, another event arrives there, 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 there. If you look at the avalanches in the creep, it's completely different, much more reminiscent of uh, earthquakes or, uh, and I cannot claim at all to be an expert in this field, so I won't say more uh, on earthquakes, but uh, clearly you get one big event which uh, arrives here, and then these events triggers a lot of spatially correlated events, and then something else starts elsewhere, and this event starts a lot of strongly correlated spatially events. So already we see that there is a very strong, I mean th there is at least two types, I would say, of avalanches that, uh, that one can identify. Now, if you want to study the distribution of surface of events, so the probability of finding an avalanche of size S uh, in the system, uh, the, the for deepening, this is a problem that has been very well studied and the experts are uh, essentially in the audience, so you can uh, uh, discuss directly with them, but the idea is that the probability of finding an event of size S is a power law of the size with a certain exponent, which again can be related to the dimension and the roughness uh, exponent. Of course, here the roughness exponent corresponding to the deepening, which is about 1.2 instead of the two thirds at equilibrium. Here is the measurement of the avalanches uh, that were extracted from the numerical simulation and one sees uh, several things uh, on this measurement. So this is the size of the avalanche properly rescaled and this is the probability here to find an avalanche of size S again properly rescaled and you see first that there is a power law of distribution of size so in that respect this is very much like the deepening of course the exponent is not the same and then there is a very strong cutoff uh, on this power law so it's only power law up to a size s max let's say that is here so the first thing is to identify the uh, the um, the size uh, s max and the size s max is very well compatible with L opt to the power d plus zeta equilibrium, which would be exactly the size of something that would be of transverse size L opt, and then move forward by a displacement which is L opt to the zeta, which is the natural displacement associated with the size L opt. So it shows that the, the thermal nucleus that I was talking before is not perfect, 
uh, is even 245 on my timer, so I should hurry, uh, that the size allopt is, is not a typical size, but it's an upper size for the avalanche. Uh, and the, this avalanche process are occurring with a distribution which is the typical or which is a power law up to this size allopt, and then there are essentially no events of size which is larger than allopt. Now the decay exponent, this exponent, of course, uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, official formula to, to compute it. There was a proposal by uh, Pierre, Kai, and Middleton that one could perhaps replace here in this formula the depending exponent by the equilibrium exponent, which would have given an exponent of four-fifth. And you see that the numerical result is in disagreement with this uh, uh, ID, uh, finding a much larger exponent than uh, the naive value that would come by replacing here zeta by zeta equilibrium. The idea is that this comes from the fact that many of these events are correlated, and if one wants to uh, correct for this, instead of looking at uh, an individual avalanche, one can try to look at the cluster of avalanches. So there is a way to connect these avalanches, and with some arbitrariness uh, in, in how we stop the cluster, uh, we can define uh, not the individual avalanche, but, uh, sorry, uh, but consider this as a single event, if you want, then a new event starts, so we consider this as a second single event, and so on and so forth, and if one does this, uh, then you see two things that happen. Again, probability of finding the size of the avalanche here, the size of the avalanche. Now there are two regimes that are visible in the numerics. One regime where one finds the power law this time with a proper, quote proper, let's say with a canonical formula, but where one has replaced the zeta by the zeta equilibrium. So this is the cluster corresponding to the, sh to the, uh, the short size, the small size. And then when you pass the uh, optimal uh, nuclear uh, nucleus, the thermal nucleus, you still have a distribution of size of the avalanche. As I said, you expect a deepening like phenomenon and this is exactly what you see. You see a distribution of size of the avalanche with the power law that one would expect by putting the roughness, which is the deepening roughness, which again is about uh, 1.2 or something like this. Uh, if you measure the structure factor of the line, you see also the change of the roughness uh, in the structure factor, as you would expect. So the short distance are controlled by the, sorry, the large distance are controlled by the deepening. The short distance are controlled by the equilibrium. Okay, my time is up, it's time to conclude. There are crucial thermal effects for disordered elastic systems. We have some level of good analytical and numerical methods, but there is still a lot of things that we need to understand. The main, the take home message is that there are avalanches in the creep, but they are extremely correlated spatially. And uh, there are still some open question on the, the clusters and the exponents. And of course, then the, 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 the cherry on the top of the cake is if this can be checked in experiment. And on that, I stop and thank you for your attention. So the, the cutoff size is when nothing happens for a while and a new event, yeah, sorry. But, sorry. So the way the clusters are defined is to say, okay, there you see it stops for a while, a new event starts. So this is our size for the cluster. Sometime you get clusters which reach the whole size of the system, then we are in trouble. Uh, so then either one takes a bigger system and usually we restart a new event. So when the, when the, sorry? There is no natural way to really separate the cluster except to say, okay, here we can define this as a cluster, here we can define that as a cluster, and uh, the natural cutoff is the size of the system. Yeah, finite size effect. At that stage, it's finite size effect. So, 
uh, again, here, if you're close to the deepening force, there is no creep. In the sense, the velocity is not exponentially small in the parameter or whatever. As you see here, at t equals zero, it's a power law of the distance to the threshold. Of course, it's zero on the other side because you're below deepening. Uh, so in, in a, if you define creep by some exponential object, you only get it here. And uh, I would say because one takes off a damp dynamics, the memory of the initial condition is very rapidly lost in all this uh, in all this process. And there are issues on what would happen if you include inertia and so on, which are very interesting questions, but which are beyond this. by different communities. Yeah. No, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> when, when did I say that? <laughs> when did I say that? So let me say, answer the first part of the question. Yes, there are many fantastic studies when you apply a force just above the threshold. You can ask Pierre and Kai. They did uh, uh, really an exhaustive and extensive study, for example, using FRG on many uh, properties which happen when you're just above threshold. If you're just below threshold, transient regime is interesting. The line will move for a while and stop. And there are quantities we try to obtain. For example, this length here, this length scale here, which is shown as a dashed line, is describing the transient regime. So, but, but uh, uh, again, in, in the tr if you're below threshold at t equals zero, the line will move for a while and then will we'll stop. But uh, studying the transient regime is interesting. It's more complicated because you cannot use the fact that you're in a steady state for the, for the motion. No, no. So the movie that I showed, sorry, I should have made it clear, is for forces which are there. Very close to zero. And again, to be able to realize this movie and the whole study, uh, one needs something else than molecular dynamics because otherwise you would have to weigh the age of the universe uh, before you see something. Or you need a computer which has a, a time clock of femtoseconds, like an experiment. Pesa o café.